Okay, go live. This should be live in just a second. There we go. We're live. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are Sans Titus, so nobody can sing a catchy little ditty for us tonight. Uh, he he had more important affairs with uh, his other podcast, so we got we got ditched. But I'm here. Uh, Anthony's on. We got Blanky Dave and a special guest this week, Keyshawn Washington, who is. Are you in Lancaster? Or are you in York tonight? Uh, right now, I'm in Lancaster. Lancaster. So we um, we wanted to obviously we. If anybody caught the show last week, we were. We they had a Q and A. I, I was actually gone last week, but we did a Q and A. Um, and what everybody wanted to talk about was, uh, well, at least what a lot of people wanted to talk about was racial relations. And with everything going on lately since Mr. Floyd's murder in Minneapolis, um, it's on everybody's mind. Obviously, so we've been we've been um, talking about it some back and forth and. We've been reading some of Keyshawn's stuff that he's been putting out. It's been really encouraging. I think we've all been really blessed by some of the things you're writing. So we wanted to get together and have more of that conversation together. So where should we start tonight? Why don't, uh, yeah, does anybody have an opener? Well, I had written a few questions and now I have to roll back to them but i one of my questions sorry somebody else has one go because my tech has been acting up on me all evening and well let's let's just lay out some expectations for the evening and in, in big sweeping gestures i think that that what i'm hearing from a lot of christian circles is a couple of things we have the main issue of a, a kind of a schism in the church between between people who who don't really think there's any problem like this is just uh out of order uh anarchists and and rebels that are seizing on an opportunity to play out their evil character in and it's in public view so it's just rioting and looting and it's just mm -hmm. a criminal element and there's nothing really to to be on about that takes a few different manifestations you know it's it's summarized with the all lives matter commentary and and they it seems to be generally are people that are in favor of the trump administration and conservative politics writ large so there's that whole contingency of the conservative spectrum that thinks there's there's nothing really wrong with race the civil rights act was passed in the 60s and we should all get over it there's, I think, a middle section of people that don't know what to think, and there's there's a small but growingly, increasingly louder version of the contingency of the conservative churches, especially young people, I think, is where I'm seeing it most, who, who really want to listen and want to hear and assume that after watching several people murdered by the police in, in cold blood on the streets and, and filmed live and spread to the world, that there's probably something going on that we should be talking about. So I'd like to address all three of those categories. And then if we get past that, I'd like to see if we can talk some about, about race in our country, but also about race in our churches. And, and, and I think it's burning on everybody's mind why, why conservative churches for the most part are so glaringly white. So those, that's, a, that's kind of an overview agenda. Why don't we start by addressing what is really the issue? Is there an issue? So I would like to highlight um, a perspective that I share and acknowledge that I'm coming at this um, short of this past week, not ever meeting someone that was like me and i'll explain that here i met a i met a man or i say i met i read i saw a video from a man named eric miller i believe it was a response to candace owens video i've uh, i've shared that i promoted that and um 
seeing someone of color that is uh, has longevity in the church, has not left, um, is not, um, and I'm going to be careful in saying this, I have a lot of friends that could think I'm talking about them, but I'm not. If I'm your friend, I'm probably not. Um, that are bitter, that have left and stay connected to criticize, but are not actually a valid, a, a working voice in the church. Um, and that's really common. And it's not necessarily, it's not really their fault. It's there's a problem that has pushed them out that has caused the problem. So all that is to say, um, I share this perspective and it's very lonely and it has been very lonely. And so the last few weeks to hear um, Mennonite voices, and like you said, Matthew, especially young voices um, say, no, we through our lines, through our eyes have been able to see that something is really wrong, okay? We can't keep seeing these things and saying, oh, that's just the world, that's just how they are, you know? And, um, and uh -huh. not taking any responsibility or any, any thought as to how we're supposed to be reacting to this um, which is, again, not surprising to me, but I found some friends saying, I can't believe what, what they're saying to you. I can't believe what they're doing. And I'm like, this has been my life for 13 years. Huh. And this is light compared to where it was um, when the Trayvon Martin thing happened. I mean, right. that, that was, so this has actually been more progressive than most other situations. And so when people say, it just feels like it, like it really exposed the um, ethnocentrism, prejudice, dare I say even racism in our churches, I say it didn't expose it, you just became aware, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so as we become aware, the reason I write, the reason um, I, I put my neck out there to be cut off, um, and it, it does definitely get slashed at, what I'm willing to do um, is because I feel that especially for young people, especially for people who I have uh, come to know and come to speak to, um, to young married couples, to people who have children that are young, is also an audience that has responded really well. I would like to mm -hmm. speak clearly, but gracefully, that this is what the problem is. This is what it looks like from my lens. And here is why I think we are where we're at. And this is why I'm, I'm hurt. And many others are hurt right now. This is why people are bitterly leaving our churches over and over again when they're at minorities. Um, some people will immediately close that off and say, it's a sin problem, not a skin problem. And I'm like, well, that's not contrary to what I write. What's your point? They'll, they'll say things like, I don't see color. And I'm like, well, I think that's pretty ridiculous, but let's talk. And most times it comes in, by the time I'm able to get a word out, I'm called a liberal and I'm accused of uh. trying to take political action, which is really uh. ironic because it tends to be the Trump voting crowd right? that, that uses the arguments of people like Candace Owen and uses the arguments <laughs> of the tweets of Trump and tries to politicize this thing. Uh -huh. And it's truly despicable that my perspective as a, as a person of color, and, and I, I have to be careful my language when I write, I, I try to eliminate the personal feelings I have, right? I try, I try to follow the principle of standing up for the, for the rights of others and not for myself. And so I'm not trying to sound bitter. I'm not bitter. I have um, completely forgiven every wrong to me that's ever happened to me in my life. And that's been by grace, um, which has been a powerful work in my life. Um, but as I, as I share from this perspective of pain, um, I share a voice that is shared in part, not completely, because not every Black person thinks the way I do. And, um, but is a voice that is very prevalent in the people who are hurt right now. Um, so I would say there are several things that highlight the problem. Um, one is what we're hoping to get to here at the end is the fact that we can't keep people in the church. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of us can point to people and you've seen their voices on social media um, that have left and are frustrated and are uninterested in returning. Um, uh -huh. And so our success rate is low. And usually for a long time, I would tell people to stop focusing on the success rate, especially when it came to discipleship with kids clubs, with um, things like that. Cause I would go and speak at kids clubs and they're like, we've never had one of you. 
<laughs> we, we've, we've been doing this for 30 years. We've never had a Kishan. Why is that? And um, I've got I've got an opinion, but I usually try to, you know, humbly say, you know, reality is this is about the kingdom. It's not about your success. Um, continue to love people and move forward. But I've become, over the last five years, um, quite unsatisfied with the complacency and the the um, the lack of responsibility and ownership of Jesus' teachings and his call for the church. It's not that to say necessarily that we are responsible for the problems of the world. It's to say we are responsible to behave like Jesus and to do what he told us to do. And as I've read the scriptures, people say it's a sin problem, not a skin problem. And I can resonate with that because as I read the life of Jesus, as I study how he interacted, the way that he uses non um Jewish people in his parables to promote them as heroes, the way that he uh -huh. um, basically spoke on their behalf in front of his people, almost getting kicked off a cliff, the way that he, uh, the way that he um, in a, came to Paul, and Paul went on to preach to the to the Jewish and the um, Gentile church, and said, you guys need to get together. And he talked about these tensions, these tensions of culture. Um, and I'm saying, why in the world? have I just now, after being discipled by Mennonites for this many years, just now opened up my eyes to the fact that this is actually a biblical teaching. Right. This is not just common sense. Mm -hmm. It's not just my conscience. Mm -hmm. It's not just, I've always yeah. felt we're disinterested. I've always felt that we're doing a terrible job. But I, all of a sudden, I, my eyes opened up to these scriptures and these examples from Jesus. Uh, I um, Recently, I, I've read through the Bible in nine days. Um, and as I read, I just continually, even that quickly, because usually you do that, you won't get anything out of it, they say. Um, but as I continued to read and I began to pursue these scriptures in a new way that um, has been growing throughout the last few years, I realized that although it sounds really bad, although it sounds really harsh and, and it feels like a big stone to throw at the church that I've come to love and appreciate, um, here's the stone. The stone is the fact that the church has ignored scriptures as a whole, a culture, and not just Mennonites, but every Anabaptist culture that's out there. As a whole, we have found ourselves completely um, off base when it comes to several things. One of them is what it actually means to be non-resistant and how it looks in the world. Another is um, the two kingdom theology. Um, another is how to be agents of love and light in the world. And we're off base. And it's not good enough for young people just to be frustrated. We, we definitely have to be at a place where we're able to identify, honestly, church leaders can step in and can honestly say to the congregation, brothers and sisters, it is time for us to act. It is time for us to do things in our communities, to do things where we're at, do things in our lives, and come before God, come before the cross and say, we are guilty. It's not about um, apologizing for our whiteness. I don't care about that stuff. I think those rhetorics are ridiculous. And in fact, uh -huh. I, I would point out to you that a lot of my black friends agree, um, both yeah. Mennonite, ex-Mennonite and never Mennonite, that, that that's not what we're pushing for. We're not pushing for uh -huh. um, for that. And and um, we're, we're actually pushing for the church to repent, a church that we're a part of, uh -huh. a kingdom that we're a part of. And that's why it's frustrating when political voices are prioritized over brothers and sisters. We, we, we stand up and, we, and we've been saying for years, we are hurt because of this. This is what we're going through. And the church has responded with rebuttals by mm -hmm. showing a cheap video that's not even kingdom, kingdom friendly, not even kingdom based, to shut down the voices of people who are hurting mm -hmm. in our own church. And so now people are realizing that ugliness extends not just to the church, but also to the world. And people observe that, people feel that, and it really does condemn us. And so that's in, in short, in, in passion, um, the, the gist of how I feel. The, the quick five minute pitch I've been getting, all the dozens of phone calls I'm, I've gotten the last couple of days, all the emails and messages. And they ask Keyshawn, what really is wrong? Like, why are you, why are you writing these articles? What's What's the passion? Where's it coming from? And it's, it's, it's that, exactly that, that the church has been blind. And they were blind. And I recognized when I was 13 and I became a member of our church, I knew this. 
Right. And now I'm at a place where I literally, as a independent adult, could walk away if I wanted to. And so I've had to really question whether or not that's that's what I should do. If there's a if there's a, a closer example to someone who really actually pays attention to the scriptures for real, actually takes Jesus's life and actually models it. And I'll, I'll end with this, just a quick example of the tension this has been for me personally. And I've, and I've talked to people who have gone through similar situations. Um, it used to be I could talk up the Shank family and it wouldn't sound prideful because I wasn't a part of the Shank family yet. And now I am. So now when I talk about our family, I'm talking about me too. Um, but you know, when I, when I came into our church, um, it was always very clear to me that the Shank family were a family of 10 Jesuses, right? They were a family of people who were able to look at what the scripture said and apply it in a way that I saw nowhere else. And I saw, wow. again, glimpses of this in our own church still from other people who were being mentored by Clayton and taught by Clayton. But when I stepped out of the church, our church, and I went and visited churches in Kansas, Nebraska, uh, other parts of PA, uh, South Carolina, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, you know, many nights get around, especially when you're going around to speak. I was like, where is that love for people? Some things were just common sense that grow tired, such as, so you live in a county where there's not a single black person and the three counties surrounding you are the same way. And um, the, you're, you have basically don't go into cities. You don't do anything with people. Um, sure, you could argue that there's a mission field in the country too, but you don't actually communicate very well with your neighbors either. Like, so what do y'all do? What do you, and so the, the, the thing that is really troubling for the Mennonites right now is if they would, in their Bible schools, which I, I call them Bible schools, they're kids clubs in Menno language. I don't like the word club. Um, but, you know, if we call them Bible schools and all the Bible schools and all the Sunday schools to our own children and all of our church services, if we would disciple people with an accurate reflection of who Jesus really was, the problem is that the person who's being discipled would look at us and say, why don't you behave like him then? Like you're telling me these ideals, you're telling me these stories, you're telling me these things, but that's not what Mennonites do, right? Mm -hmm. And I've seen people come in and they glowingly um, adore Mennonite culture, right? Um, but some people come in and say, if we're really going to take the scriptures to their fullest conclusion, really take the honest, um, full transformation um, and really, really live life by this example that we've been given, then um, we're going to have to do something different than what we're doing right now. Because it's very selfish. It's very ethnocentric. It's culturally narrow. And ultimately, uh, it's racist. It has become racist. It's become yeah. to a point where people are looked at at, at their skin color in a lesser way. And I've got those stories to back those up, but I'll stop there because it's supposed to be a five minute pitch and that became a 10 minute pitch. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you this question. It, do you feel like things are different now? Like I, so I think probably most of the people here know now, I, I, I don't come from Anabaptist background either. I, I actually have an anti-police slur tattooed on the back of my neck because I was a street kid myself. So I don't, I don't, I don't show up with the same um, assumptions that a lot of people do that that look like me now. But I've been watching police brutality and misconduct for 20 years. I, I pay attention to all the national cases, and I've never seen anything. This didn't happen with Tamir Rice. It didn't happen with. Um, <clears throat> It didn't happen with the Ferguson. It didn't happen with Eric Garner. Like there were movements that happened and riots that happened, but they were regional and mostly localized. And I haven't seen anything like what's happening now. Have you had these convers? Have you had the opportunity to have these conversations with your brothers and your church and more broadly in these other cases? Are we actually experiencing something new, or is this just a flash in the pan? Okay. So the truth is, yes, this is new. Okay. Um, the, the issues present have not, are not mm -hmm. new. It's not mm -hmm. like this all of a sudden one right. day we woke up and realized that right. people aren't treated well. That's always been there. Uh, we were warned about it in the scriptures. We were told mm -hmm. what to do, but we're just not doing it. Um, mm -hmm. but the, the climate mm -hmm. has definitely changed. Um, for the first time on Sunday morning, I had a conversation about, um, 
my skin color with a brother other than a shank. Mm. That was the first time. Wow. And don't hear me wow. to condemn my home church. That's not going to happen. Okay. Mm. There, there are, I've, I've reached out, I've talked to, reached out to a number of people that I work closely with, I've known for over a decade. Um, I can't speak for the whole church, but I can speak for the hearts of many that there is a th- deep desire for revival here and change. And it will happen slowly, but I'm sure it will happen in some. I've yet to see if it'll happen on the broader on the church level, the conference level, and then further into the rest of the state, whatever you want to say. Um, but it has changed because for the first time, um, one thing I'll highlight, and I won't say the brother's name, uh, because everybody I ask if they know who he is, they say yes. So I don't want to, I don't want to bring his way. But um, he put it posted a status. He's basically like, and you'll probably know what I'm talking about. But he's like, so what are the problems with black people? Uh, what are the problems that are present with them? And then how do we fix it? And I'm like, this is really interesting. Um, as I watch this thread, because it's a bunch of white Mennonites in the middle of uh, probably that live in the middle of nowhere. They probably don't have black friends. And so how are they going to know what the problem is in black America? How are, how are they supposed, mm-hmm. this common sense dictates, this is not a profitable way to, to address this, mm-hmm. but it didn't surprise me. So I broke well, one, of my, <laughs> one of my rules. I broke one of my rules from the last couple of years. I used to be very active on social media when it came to arguments and debates. I thought that was really cool to do. Um, I broke one of my rules and I sounded out because I saw some clearly racist comments, mind you, from people who attend church in the same areas that I do and that I will see sometime in the next two months. And I said, somebody needs to speak against this oppressive and racist language. This is a serious problem and no one else is going to do it. I sat there and watched and waited for someone to rebuke a brother that commented something clearly racist. The comment has been deleted since. Every comment I've address has been deleted for some reason. Um, and um, because, I think because once you realize what you said, it's, it doesn't look very good. Um, basically, to the extent of, I used to own a fruit stand and I had bad experiences with black people, therefore black people need to repent of their sins and treat me better. Um, and other, other fallacious arguments. Um, and that comment got 50 likes. It was the second oh. most liked comment on that stat. Actually, it was the first most liked for the first four days. And eventually, I think as I wrote, people saw and looked at my name, found a thread, liked my comment, which who cares how many likes I got. I was there not for the approval, for the, honestly, from my perspective, speaking out against the leader, as is written in scripture publicly, that mm-hmm. we're saying, mm-hmm. this is not right. If this is what you're preaching, if this is what you're teaching mm-hmm. to your children, to people around you, people of color who come and ask you and share their burden, can you understand what I'm saying? And you say no, because uh, fruit stand and bad black people, if that's your argument, you need to be called out for it. And I did that, and that thread got hundreds and hundreds of comments. And it's not that I've never seen a thread like that before, but I found 50 threads like that. I found um, Mm -hmm. all kinds of things. I saw articles that were being written I had um, come across friends who were fine, who were actually calling me, not from my local church at first, but friends from faith builders, friends from uh, other places and saying, is this, does this look as bad as it does to me, to you? Like, is this really this, are, are these narratives really widespread across our churches? And I told them, I've got about 20, 20 stories that I could tell you that would blow your mind. You'd never imagine your father, your brother, your pastor would say something like this to me, but if they did, mm-hmm. they did. Mm-hmm. And then I've got 500 or maybe 5,000 more of these, what are called microaggressions, micro invalidations, all these other terms that I don't use very often because it's tiring, but um, they, they do point to serious issues that people could just explain away with my feelings being hurt um, or my inferior mindset. I'm plagued by generational um, victim mentality victim mentalities mm-hmm. that, that my grandmother taught me because she didn't rise above and and um, do better and I'll tell you what guys that's not my experience my fan I mean the Washington family have a uh, are the exact opposite of victims um, in fact many of them 
although seeing these problems would much quicker just tell me to give up on the Mennonites and go find a black church that will empathize with my situation mm -hmm. than to um, sit here and whine about what's wrong. Okay. So for people to come in with these preset narratives against people of color has shown how far has is finally exposing, I believe, to everybody, including, and I'll mind you this, and this is the sad part. So if you're on the fence about the impact this is having on people, this is a sad part. I've been mentoring or informing three people of color who have families, they all have kids that are wanting to join Mennonite churches. They've reached out to me personally and said, Keyshawn, are there any churches in Florida that you can recommend? Any churches in Minnesota? Any church? And so I have some connections. I think through, I think, oh, Val's over here and Bubba Walker's down here. Let me give them a call. And they're, they're close. They're attending church services. They're moving in. Nobody knows that I'm talking to them because it's just really just friends helping each other. And they're emailing me right now saying exactly what I'm saying. How in the world can they not mm -hmm. see what we're seeing? How in the world? And, and then the ones that are well-versed in scripture are also even just as baffled. Like, how is this a kingdom response? Why is there so much hypocrisy? Why are the arguments so mind-numbing? Why are they so... And... And so this is the uh, condition, the place that we're in right now as a church is that we need to repent. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be neutral about this. It's hard to say this in an article, the church of God, not just Mennonites, but since we're Mennonites, let's focus in. We need to repent, not necessarily to one set of people. That's not good enough. We have to repent our whole life. We, we need to repent to God and granted, granted, lawless black people need to repent too it's not it's not that i'm ignoring the scriptures that tell us that we have all fallen short of the glory of god and need grace need need salvation need mm -hmm. to be born again i'm not ignoring those scriptures and i'm not letting them off the hook someone asked me yesterday why why don't you write articles about the, the plight of black people and how lazy they are and i said yeah, well don't you think that rhetoric is fully represented right now don't you think there's plenty of places to go for that <laughs> Um, and as I talk to, um, you know, my classroom is seven, seven out of eight students are Hispanic. As I talk to my black friends I've grown up with, um, black people who used to go to our church that have bitterly left and don't want to talk to anyone except for me. Um, as I talk to these people, I'm not easy on them. I do push for reconciliation. I tell them to be humble. I tell them to, ch to chase me the principles. But Mennonites aren't helping with the way that they're responding to this. I'll tell you that. And um. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that there's and so on rant. Go ahead. I, I I appreciate. Well, we had you on here to rant. We wanted to hear your rants. <laughs> That's what, right. What, what <clears throat> when you say the church needs to repent? Can you name that sin? I mean, the the job of a good prophet is to be very specific. Mm -hmm. T tell us what the church needs to repent of in regards to in in regards to race. What what where where is this coming out, these attitudes? Where are they manifesting themselves? And how do we call it what it is so that we can put it on the altar and and get rid of it. And, well, and uh, can I just, can I just add one more thing to expand on that question? Um, a lot of people like biblical terms. Um, they're like, well, racism isn't in the Bible. So, um, you know, can you talk about how, you know, you mentioned that we're not reading the Bible. And I agree with you that like there, there are themes in the scripture, I think from beginning to end that give us abundant resources for facing something like this in a Christ-like way. Um, what, what do you feel like? Yeah. What are the, what are the, um, the kingdom themes, um, you know, the specific violations in biblical terms that, that you're seeing with that the church needs to repent of? Sure. Sure. So, Now I was listening to that and I kind of lost what Matthew. Oh yeah, the sins of the sorry specifically. Yeah, got you. It's name name the sins. Well, one of them is racism, and I'm not ashamed to say that. And mm -hmm. two years ago, I would have been very lenient to use that word, but I think it's a word that describes well where the hearts are of the people who have been, either publicly or in the in the private messages, reaching out to me to uh, to tell me about my people, right? Or even using the word my the term my people is racist, apparently. Um, and so there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of ignorance, and 
people who really love me, who care about me, have said, Keyshawn, you have to realize they're just ignorant. It's not that they have bad hearts. It's just that they're ignorant. And I believe, based off of my experience and the things that I'm hearing, that the stories that I've been hearing in the last three weeks, but even more than that, is that there is objectively a heart that is working against love, against the kingdom, against how we should be addressing people. And I think it's a work of Satan. I think it's a work of darkness. We, you know, people have sent the verse, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, um, but against principalities. And, and I've used that verse. I'm not unfamiliar at all with that concept. And I agree with it wholeheartedly. And that's my point, is that I think we viewed this as a flesh thing. Um, and it's gotten us to race ideologies. I think, I think it's about the scriptures, the realization of spiritual warfare prompting us to action that has not happened, that has led us to where we are. And so the way I see us getting here is different than how some others will see it. But we are not disagreeing about those scriptural values. We're disagreeing about how people are using them against action, against discomfort. Um, we are sinful of, la of laziness, of being sloths, of being people who see the need and say, uh, I'm inadequate, so I'll just pray and live a good life here. Maybe I'll shine a flashlight of my life around the world and they can see how great I am. But other than that, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in leaving my um, homestead and moving out into the world to help people, um, including, again, down the street to their, the farmer Joe, who is also not a Christian, who is just as broken and short of the glory of God as any other Black Lives Matter protester out there in the streets right now. Um, and so those are, those are two things. And also just to be, just to be clear, you look at the fruits of the spirit, you look at what characterizes a Christian and those fruits are, are more than ever in my eyes coming into question, coming into question and making me wonder if those things are really present in the lives of these Mennonite heroes that I've paid attention to over the years. And I have, I have uh, adored their teachings. Um, and so racism, I think, is the clear one that's being addressed right now. But as always, the political climate will change. The information given to people will change. And so different outrages will come. You know, next we'll be talking about, about other things. And so we will move on from this one highlighted issue. But I think a lack of love, a lack of willing to, being willing to act. We, have, we are working long work days. We are doing lots of youth and church activities to pursue and take care of ourselves. But when it comes to all of the promptings from Jesus to act in the world, to love the sinner, to love these people who are downtrodden, the fatherless, the widows, the mm -hmm. anybody who is honestly in pain and struggling and afflicted, um, we're just not, point blank period. We're not, as a whole. And, and, I, and I would consider that to be condemning. I don't think it's just a simple thing of ignorance or we just have to well, be aware of that and see if you can make, if you can be a better person in the future. I think we need serious revival and repentance. If we're going to repent, repenting of something, right? I mm -hmm. think we have to repent of a lack of love. We have to repent of, of racism. Um, on top of my mind, I'm not sure how to say we should repent of ethnocentrism. I think that's a decency thing in terms of just treating people well. But I guess kindness and goodness to all is something that we could repent of not being better at. Um, and then I think with, again, with this enticement of following conservative media, which is usually right. where it's at, um, I think that there's, there's things that have highlighted, been highlighted now that need repentance of as well. Um, a, um, a gospel that is not of the kingdom, but is of the world and has corrupted the hearts of our people and led them to believe that black people are generationally cursed that any, any more than anyone else in the world right now, um, that they are, um, they are subpar. There are some that have told me, and again, you would be shocked, brothers, to find out who the people who have been saying this, the people whose blogs you read, the people who you heard at reach, at conventions, at KFW, mind you. These brothers are saying things like black people are genetically inferior. And I'm telling you, if I was bitter, I could, I could make an exposed piece on this. But I'm really interested in seeing people love more. I'm interested in seeing our church and the people around me, especially locally, repent of those things that I've listed there. And Anthony, uh, Anthony what, did we, what did you said after Matthew? Um, 
drawing a blank. Um, I, I think you I think you responded pretty well to it. I was just I was just asking, as you answered his question, just to, yeah, put it in in terms of, of biblical themes, and I think you did fairly well at that. Yeah, um, and I would like I what, would just yeah, go ahead. I would just point to things that I've written in my articles. Mm -hmm. One of the re one of the things that I have um tried to do, especially in my series that I wrote earlier this year, is to disarm people from being able to say. Well, that's just your perspective. That's just that's just mm -hmm. Keyshawn what he sees. But for me over here, I don't see color. I don't this. I don't that. And so I try. I went to the scriptures. I said, here are the verses that you've been studying your entire life, and here's what you've missed. Here's what here's what the disconnect is, and those are all throughout. But the thing that I've noticed recently are these verses about oppression. These verses about um removing the hand of the oppressor and a lot of these are old testament so people can just dismiss them if they don't like them and take the ones they do which is a classic in a baptist thing um but anyway um one thing of note is in proverbs um i pray you will open your mouth for the mute for the rights of all who are destitute open your mouth you know what did that look like then did that look like a you know an absence of commitment to spiritual things or was there a real world issue here that god is saying stop acting like you can just lift your head up and say i'm just spiritual i'm not living in the i don't have a physical presence here in the world and it doesn't matter how i act um you go to the new testament the the simple thing of matthew 7 12 um do for others as you would want them to do for you the church has to ask a serious question have they treated black people the way they want to be treated have they right yes or no and if the answer is no something has to be done because if we don't mm -hmm. act more bitterness will spring the gospel's message will continue to be tainted that's the other thing mm -hmm. that's at stake here like our reputation does matter as a church it does it is significant how the world sees us if i go on the street and i say i'm from tidings of peace mennonite church and they hear the word mennonite and think racist mm -hmm. that hurts me right that yeah. does hurt me and there's good reason to think that right now because there are racist Mennonites and they're the ones that are on social media using their voice. They're the ones that, again, these three people who I've been talking to closely and trying to help and help them see the good and the bad that's present in our churches are emailing me saying, what is up with this? What, what is up with what's going on right now in the world, man? Like what are Mennonites really this bad? And, and I'm, I'm over here like, yeah. We're, we're that bad, honestly. Like, my experience, my life, the voices of people who have been hurt, this is really where we are. And so, again, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't want to go through all these articles and pick out these small, these points. Sure. But I do, yeah, you've, I do you've say <clears throat> that has been my heart and intention to say, what are the scriptures saying here? Um, mm -hmm. Especially in the life of Jesus, mm -hmm. when it comes to um, his behavior um look at especially in romans the whole the whole purpose of the book of romans i think is to help us in a time like this to see the church is more than just our yeah. own people but and yet we're not uh and one thing before the next question or next comment um when is the last time you heard a sermon about justice over the pulpit when is the last time you heard these scriptures used um as a way to call us to action and maybe your church is different than mine but my experience is that we just kind of ignore it Pastors are either afraid or unaware of what this means for us in a real way today um, as a church in terms of how it causes us to act, the heart that we have, the way that we move. Um, and so anyway, that's just, those are my initial thoughts on that. So um, I have a question and um, I actually have a couple things that I'd really like to hear your thoughts on, but um, my mother joined the, uh, joined the church. Uh, she was a VBS kid. Um, joined the church when she was uh, me too. That's when she mean. was uh, what 16 maybe 17 and she really had to swim, swim upstream with her family um, so her experience kind of gave me a little bit of the perspective of uh, of the outsider coming in and it's tough um, it's it, it's tough to break into the Mennonite culture and so what I hear a lot of people say is, well, that has nothing to do with the fact you're black. It just has to do with the fact that, um, 
that, you know, it's hard to join the Mennonites, you know, so we're ethnocentric, but we're not racist. Um, I'd like to hear what, what's your response to that? I mean, I'm just like, scroll down your Facebook and I, I, I'm pretty sure I know the, the, the thread that you're talking about. And I read down that thing and, uh, the top of my head almost flew off. I couldn't believe the things that were being said. Um, but I, I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you differentiate between those negative experiences of, of even, you know, just anybody coming into the church, um, as opposed to uh, um, the the experiences of a person of color coming into the church. Yeah. Well, the word experience there describes the disconnect. Um, I, again, I tried to use these stories. I wish I could say more, more of these stories, these 20 that I mentioned, I've written them down. I have a list of them, but if I would make them public, I would, I would ostracize or I would expose, um, I would unbiblically try to highlight hurts that I've had in the past that I've never actually gone back and said to the person because either I don't know who they were, they were just the person that followed up with me after a message and I could never track them down anyway. But to put that public would um, have people messaging me saying, hey, do you uh, remember that one time I, I told you that my black children were inferior? Um, you know, they either apologize or they double down, which is even worse. Um, so I try to use my voice to, to help people see that if they don't see racism, then just listen to the stories that are there. Just listen, listen to the perspectives. And, and honestly, um, David, um, on a personal level, why don't they go and ask their church? Why don't they go start conversations? Why don't they go start? Um, give them a flat, your brother is a platform to share. And you tell me whether or not the voices in your church have a disconnect. Now, I don't know if that'll actually work because you usually hear what you want to hear. And so they'll probably leave saying, oh, people here have good hearts. And, and so you just have to see people with people. I don't see color and, um, you know, mm-hmm. life, is, life is great and the world is bad and we're doing a good job. Um, but the voices are really there. It's just people tend to be silent because I think there is a, a deep part of them that realizes this is not right. The same reason that they delete a comment after they've been confronted about it. Um, and they can see instead of apologizing or repenting or saying, this is, this is a problem. You know, I, I see that. Um, I had a really great four hour conversation on Friday. Maybe I shouldn't say that because then people will call me and want to have four hour conversations with me every Sunday, every <laughs> Saturday night. But um, it was a man that confronted me. Um, and I didn't even know why he was confronting me. I didn't know what, whether he had read an article, he saw me on thread. And he told me, he sent me a video by Vody Bachin, which is why I made the, the comment I did in my article about voting. Um, it's actually someone I have a lot of respect for, but disagree with him on these issues. Um, and uh, he sent it to me and basically he, he threw a lot of things at me to say that I need to go back to the scriptures. And again, the irony, like this is the same message I'm giving to him. So how do I actually combat this? How do I actually help him and grow myself and have the conversation? So I told him, you go, you go home and read my articles I'll watch your video and um, we'll, we'll have a conversation tomorrow. So we did. We had a conversation. It started out. I, sh- I told him my personal testimony and it's over and over again. He just couldn't believe it. I tell him a story. He, he referenced my story in one of my articles about I was sitting at a banquet and a, um, a father was talking about his struggle with his black children and, and um, how they were genetically inferior. And then he pointed at me and said, well, not you, black boy. You're, you're different than the rest. And that's textbook racism. It's any kind of racism that you could ever come up. It's racism. It's right. wrong. It's harmful. It's unbiblical. It's worthy of repentance. And he couldn't believe it. He didn't believe me. He wanted me to give him more details. He wanted me to get more examples of it. So I did. And I spent half an hour just saying, yeah, there was a time I went to Kansas and the father did this, that came to me and said this. There was a time this happened. There was time, and none of them could be disputed. If that really happened to you, then that was wrong. And I said, hold up a mirror to your church. Um, Investigate. Go ask your, go go look at, you know, just go look. And I think if you really are looking for it, you will find it. Um, And thankfully, the conversation ended. Uh, There was a lot of repentance that was needed and involved and expressed. Um, And um, 
I think he went in the church the next day and had a devotional about it and about how to pursue the world wow. and how to, you know, th those type of things do happen. There is, there are people who are listening and that's very, very um, encouraging to me, but uh, it, who's, who has time to take four hours per person and just start saying, well, you don't believe it exists, but here, let me tell you, it took me four hours to convince him of that. And honestly, we're just tired. We're tired. Right. People, people who see it and have experienced it personally do not want to be the mouthpieces of, of something that we should already see. You know, we should already acknowledge and see this, but we don't. It causes pain. It often causes bitterness and it drives people out of the church. And why hasn't happened? It happened to me yet. I truly attribute it to Jesus. I truly attribute it to this, to some strength. He wants me here for some reason. He wants me to continue pressing forward. Um, why have I not bitterly just said enough is enough? Why do I have the energy after a long day of writing or whatever to talk before? I don't know, but I, I know I can't do it forever. I know that at some point I've got, I've got to live this out myself. I've got to go um, and love the people with the connections that I have here in York um, and are growing in Lancaster. So I can't just sit around and try to, try to preach it out and try to expose it. It's going to have to be an effort that comes from the individual. And that's what makes it discouraging because we're not seeing that effort displayed by a lot of people instead. And, and, and there's two types of people who are doing responding wrong right now. There's the ones who are trying to disarm and trying to use political commentary or whatever, and even some biblical commentary that's taken out of context to dismiss this issue. And then the people who are just flat out silent. And I'd written a poem um, from inspired by Amos. Um, I'll That's read it. Good. Here. Yeah, it's good. Read it. Um, inspired by Amos five. I'm in church. I'm sitting in the back. I'm taking time to soak in all my surroundings. This isn't new. This is familiar. So far, so good. We sing, we pray, we are worshiping, but something is off. The sounds we sing echo back. What is going on? Why are we not being heard? What is God doing? How could he oppress us? I'm in church. I'm sweating in the back. I feel the condemnation. I feel the hypocrisy. A sea of white shouts words of praise to God. Few, few blotches of light brown appear like moles on a body. Unnecessary, pointless, arbitrary. We pay them no attention. I'm in church. I'm weeping. I know why God is cuffing his ears. We have not heard the cries of the hurting. What are we doing? How could we oppress them? The church has become silent. Loud hymns fill the building, but all I hear is silence. All God hears is silence. All the world hears is silence. Why are we silent? What are we doing? Let the justice flow. Let the gongs be hushed. Listen closely. They are yelling. They are pleading. And that poem is specific to one issue, right? There are people who are not silent, who are gonging around and shouting off Candace Owens and theologies as if that's supposed to inform a church on how to act um, for some reason. Um, but a lot of people, and maybe even most people, are just flat out not talking, just completely turning an eye, cuffing their ears away. And the implication here that I found in Amos is that God is going to do the same to us. Right. I was sitting in church. I was insecure. I was frustrated. And again, I'm not saying this is fair to my church. I'm not speaking on that tonight. But I was sitting there thinking of the, glo the global Anabaptist church or community, the culture rather, um, and thinking through this. And I'm like, is God even hearing these hymns? Is God even hearing you know, we sing hymns like, um, hear my cry, hear my cry, oh God, attend to my prayer. I was sitting in church last night. I couldn't sing. I was, I was sitting here thinking that as a whole, we have work to do before we can really claim that our worship is being heard. And it's, again, it's a struggle, an ugly struggle that might not make, a, it might not be based in common sense. But as I read the scriptures and I see this, I feel convicted for our church, for our culture. I feel I feel like corporately we are having complacent and silent more so than using racist rhetoric, which is becoming, again, like you mentioned, Matthew, um, become to the forefront. 
um, recently, but um, it has uh, mostly been what has hurt me the most is the lack of conversation, the lack of care that has come to, that has always been present. I think that as I, as I watch what's happening now, um, I, I, I think that the church has lost her way and, and, and it's kind of an understandable reaction. What's, what's been most disappointing to me as I've been watching is that for some reason, we're not trained anymore to look suspiciously at power and power disparities. And, and it doesn't, it, when, when I see people, there's so many people that are speaking on behalf of the powerful, like there's not an eye to oppression. And I, I, I think that that's a matter of, I don't think it's a matter of viciousness, but I don't know if it ever was a matter of viciousness. I don't know if it was a matter of viciousness in Isaiah's day. It was just a matter of being comfortable and not caring and turning your eyes away. And so what happens is when you have, when you have, when you've done that, when you've created a really nice life for yourself and a really nice place, then you, you don't have a good sense for how to empathize with what it means to be at a different place. So when, when you look at rioting and looting, all you can think of is lawlessness. You can't imagine what would happen in a community to cause people to react that way when you when you see mr floyd or some other person being killed whether it's whether it's a white person or a black person or a latino you just think my my benefit of the doubt goes to the power structure that person must have done something wrong yeah and Mm -hmm. that assumption is the opposite of what i expect as a christian i expect christians to be suspicious of power now I don't I don't want ever I don't want Christians to be rioters and looters and lawless people but I do I do expect them to be suspicious of power. Like I I I I accept I expect if you read the gospel narrative and you see the relation of power to the kingdom of God and all of our two kingdom people supposedly do then the best view you should have of him as a Roman soldier. Like, yeah, he's making order in the world in some sense, but he's, there's no, there's no misapprehensions about his benevolence or his goodness. It's just, he's a function of state to wield a sword, to try to keep things moving, to keep the machinery greased. But he's, but this idea that we always come down on the side of power and like, it's the opposite. We're always, favoring the the power structure always always ignoring what it's like to be under instead of over and that has to be from isolation it has to be from from being disconnected to the world at large the king james uses the expression condescend to men of low estate which ironically sounds condescending now but (laughs) but it but what it means is the ability to come down the ability Mm -hmm. to get off of your off of your horse and come see what it's like for somebody else in a different part of the world. And that's fantastically missing among conservative people. I don't think that anybody thinks about what it's like to live on the other side of the tracks, to live in a broken home, to live with addiction, to live with crime and violence and problems all around you. And not just individually, but the systems and structures that prop those that whole way of life up. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I want to scream from the rooftops that the problem is we're not suspi- we, we've totally misconstrued what God's saying about being a friend of the world. Worldliness yeah. is not the color of clothes that you wear or the car that you drive or the music that you listen to. Worldliness is being sympathetic and in line with the structures of the world that cause oppression and death. Yes. And that's completely missed. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and more than isolation is where do you get your information? Or maybe this is a sub issue of isolation. Where do you get your understanding of the world if you're not paying attention to anyone that is different than well, you? And you're probably going to get it from the trusted Mennonite sources of fill in the blank. 
And then if you quote CNN, if you quote MSNBC, it's all lies. But if it comes from the source where they seem to find a closer narrative to what they like or think, um, seems to be more rounded out and knowledgeable and um, less attacking on their conscience, that becomes truth. And, and it's, it's amazing to me how much misinformation is out about how most protests in America right now have been looking. I think uh, even in my home church, I got a message from a concerned brother um, say, sending me articles and YouTube videos of riots and tell, asking me how in the world can I advocate that we should be downtown participating in this, which is a fallacious argument. I never advocated for the state in riots. Um, there was one incident of violence in New York. Um, a lady, a white lady tried to um, drive through a crowd and she got stopped. She then got out of her call, car and she was attacked. Not justifying anybody in that situation, but it wasn't exactly a riotous pulling right. a brick into a window. Um, everything else has been a worship service, has been a, um, a prayer session. Um, there have been people who are wanting to be heard. And I think we can be involved in all three of those situations. I think that we can sit there and listen to people as they talk. I think that's a weakness in our culture that we're, uh, we're, we're coming with, um, with voices to preach. We're coming to, um, we're ready to teach and preach. And one of the things I pointed out in my article is that maybe we should disband Bible clubs and maybe we should um, instead do things that engage the voices and have conversation because we typically, when I sit in on kids clubs or even youth or adult ministries, there is a Mennonite man going up there, um, giving a talk, and then he opens up for questions and nobody has any questions. And so we're, we're even failing on a conversational level to actually hear and, and grasp out those voices and opinions of other people. Um, and so some people can feel like, well, they don't actually share with me because I'm just, you know, I'm the evil, dangerous white guy. And I'm saying, well, you're also not very tactful. Um, you're not very good at pursuing people in conversation. And I was, I've been benefited very well from a man named Stephen Brubaker at Faith Builders who um, put into words what I've always felt, um, that when you want to talk to someone, there are good ways to go about that. Um, I've contemplated, and I'm not going to do it because it's uh, honestly shouldn't be, shouldn't be written um, for various reasons. I contemplated writing an article, 10 things you can say to black people to start conversation. Um, but that would be inappropriate because of the fact that my audience is not just white people. It's, it's not, it's not, I shouldn't have to say, this is how you treat people of color as people, as human beings that have intellectual opinion. But the narrative in social media and politi po politics has been the inferiority of black people, whether it be intellectual, spiritual, um, or in a socioeconomic way. But the, the most hurtful one really that hits the heart the most is the intellectual part. I know so many intelligent people of color, um, mm -hmm. it's not based on the color of their skin, and yet people will tend to talk to them like they're five-year-olds, and it really bothers me. Wow. And I, I think the problem is that because of our biases that we're not checking, we're not working against, that we all have, mind you. I've written about prejudice before. Um, I've got them. I've got to work against them. I've got to work to, to become a better lover of people around me, um, to have a real-world perspective on the fact that in, in the real world, I do relate to people who are different than me, and that matters, um, especially if I want to spread the gospel to them. Um, I have to learn how to ask good questions and just listen. And um, on that phone call for four hours, the, fun, the conversation started with me listening. With, or at least at some point, I was just quiet. I let him talk, let him, and thankfully he stopped to let me talk. Sometimes I do that and it, I get my own taste, my own medicine, and nobody lets me say what I'm gonna say. Um, but that ability to listen, I think is something that I've seen effective in letting someone get their thought out, which you guys have done well at tonight, thank you. Um, letting someone get their thought out and um, hearing them for what they're saying, not what they're not, not insulting their intelligence, not assuming the worst in them, but trying to find that Jesus in them. Again, we are all bearing an image of mm -hmm. God that is noticeable, that is observable, that is beautiful. And, and our, our colors do not have to get in the way of that. We, we can, through conversation, be amazed at the intellect and the, and the gifts of the people around us. That's not the focus that we are having. 
I, I love being able to sit down and email and talk to people of color. And, and for, maybe it shouldn't be especially, but it is. I, I love it when I can come across a culture that I can relate to or that I'm around every day and wonder and, and just figure out what they're good at, figure out what they like, figure out what they're burdened by. Um, that shapes me. It helps me to know how I can help, how I can pray and how I can act. Why is that so absent in evangelism today? Whatever evangelism is actually happening. Why is it absent in kids' clubs? Why is it absent in evangelism Sundays that churches do? We have to do better at thinking practically about how to engage people in a way that we are just, we're wanting to learn just as much as them. Um, we obviously come with a message with a hope that is far greater than whatever they have to offer if they're not Christians. We know that. We have that acknowledged. But we don't have to start off um, waiting for something to pounce on to to show them their evilness and their their lack of not being as good and knowledgeable as we are. Um, mm -hmm. I think, again, Matthew, it, it comes to isolation. It comes to political um, jargon and whatever else. Um, but I think ultimately we uh, – we just aren't, we could handle some training. We could, I wish people could sit in that class um, by Stephen Brubaker and, uh, and learn how to engage and talk to people in the real world. That would be very helpful. But it's hard for me um, to know how to write about that. Um, Keyshawn, you've, you've um, gone kind of around the edge of this, this question a couple of times and I, I agree with what you're saying. By the way, I do want to say, um, going back to something you said before, we, those of us that are here right now, believe you, um, we're not, we're not listening to your story with any incredulity. Um, we, we, we have seen enough, um, and we, and to, to to have seen this for ourselves and some of us i think maybe all three of us have watched it for quite some time um not just this last week and have been very burdened by it so i want you to know that <laughs> that you don't have to convince us um and i hope that our audience is feeling the pain and anger um that's coming through here from you because because i i think it's prophetic and and this is this is a point that that I think is really important for for people listening to understand um, about the scripture and how it relates to these things. The scriptures were were written over a long period of time, but Israel's prophets, um, you know, in the in the Old Testament, Israel was always an uh, nearly always during most of its history an underdog nation. They were surrounded by big powerful nations who were always a threat to them like if they didn't if if they didn't have supernatural protection their enemies just just swarmed in from all sides and and you know ate their crops and and violated their women and it was horrible um they were the oppressed um in their world and when Jesus came on the scene, it was maybe more that way than it had ever been for a long period of time for Israel. It, they were just, this was part of their history. They're always looking for salvation from their oppressors. And everything in the scriptures is written out of that experience. It's written by people who are underneath calling out for righteousness toward those who are above um, in the sense of, of economic and and uh, military and 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 social power, and so if you have if 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 an entire culture of people such as the Anabaptists in North America have and 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 conservative white people in North America in general have somehow undergone a shift from being oppressed. As, as our Anabaptist forebears were, um, to being, to, to finding themselves suddenly in a demographic that, that all of the power structures are set up to serve. Um, you are suddenly looking at the, it's like looking at the scripture through the wrong end of a binoculars. Um, you're looking down um, from the position of power 
and the powerful have always hated the prophets. The powerful always hated the rebuke, the prophetic rebuke, and 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 the powerful hated Jesus' gospel when he was here. Um, and so and so that's that's what we're dealing with when 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 we as white, you know, Protestant adjacent North Americans, North Americans are 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 looking at this issue, we've got to remember that we're looking at it the opposite way of ever, pretty much from the opposite perspective of everyone who wrote the scriptures. Yeah. And it's going to take effort to do that. And that's why, that's why, like one of the, I think one of the most obvious things you would do, um, if you wanted to reverse that effect, you know, and turn the binoculars right side around, um, would be to listen to people who are still in that situation that the writers of scripture were in um like you Keyshawn, and 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 we have and if we shut out those voices if we're thinking of ways to silence them which which is what i hear happening in these conversations it's like you know it cre creating all of these all of these just transparently self-serving narratives to just <laughs> invalidate mm -hmm. the voices of of uh, people of color um if we do that we are essentially um it's like we're choosing to wear blinders to the truth and and we're we're cutting ourselves off from an opportunity god has given us to actually understand his burden for the world so so i i, I am I am glad that you've been frank with us tonight um, and that you have, I don't feel like you've, I'm sure you've held back, but, but I, I feel like you held back less than you have in your, in the writing of yours that I've seen. Um, and, and I think this is, I think this is really something, um, you know, I, I've, I've focused most in the last while on um, other forms of abuse. I mean, I think racism is really a, a, a form of abuse in that it dehumanizes yes people who are not like us 100%. Um, and uh, people who are vulnerable and weaker. Um, but, you know, I've, I've, I'm working with domestic violence and, and, um, and, and, and informally um, have been, you know, trying to be a voice and, and fight on the, on the sexual abuse front as well. And we see similar patterns of responses mm -hmm. to all of these cries in Anabaptist circles and 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 we real i think we really need to i mean my message to our listeners hard as it is to say and this is very personal for me um because i don't consider myself today i'm an ethnic anabaptist but i i, I had to cut loose of this desire for respectability that's the thing that you Keyshawn, uh, you know the way your story sounds you never had the luxury of choosing whether you're going to be a respectable Anabaptist or not, um, simply by virtue of of the demographic you represent. But for me, I had I had to cut loose of that in order to in order to embrace truth on these things. And this is really a, we need to be willing to ask ourselves existential questions about our identity as as Anabaptists today. Um, are we willing to, you know, if the church doesn't repent? Um, if the church continues to dig in, if we really aren't on, on by and large interested and w not willing to become interested, not willing to learn to care about the plight of the oppressed on all of these different fronts that are all confronting us at once now, um, then Jesus says, come out from among them. And 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 I feel like I feel like that's something you're wrestling with, and and no one can tell you what to do with that. But each of us in our congregational situation, uh, when we hear this prophetic rebuke, we have to ask ourselves: Is there are there still eyes that are open to see this? Are there still ears that are open in your context? And if there are, praise God. If there are not, um, there might be a time to become to to where you need to move change who you fellowship with so you're not implicated. I'm not speaking to you, Keyshawn. I feel like you're in a very remarkably, you know, I, you've expressed that you're in a remarkably supportive place. Yes, um, absolutely. But, but my question, 
and, and I maybe I'm jumping around here, but you kept mentioning how the silence hurts you. And those of us who have spoken out on a, issues of abuse and on racism, you know as well as I do, we encounter this immediately as white people. Um, uh, accusations of virtue signaling. Oh, you just want to be seen as woke or, you know, associate, you're jumping on a bandwagon, you're not doing anyone any good. Um, can you talk a little bit briefly about, um, from your perspective, is, is speaking by people like me meaningful to you? And what kind of, you know, if we're attempting to be supportive, what kind of support is useful to you and you feel like moves our, you know, the, the heart of our culture toward repentance and what types of communication are not? Yeah. One, one thing that I've been correctly challenged on, and it doesn't reflect my lack of awareness of, but I'm glad people pull it out, is each time it's not just about talking. It's not just about saying people have said things in the past. People mm -hmm. have spoken out on behalf of black people and people of color, um, mm -hmm. but that hasn't changed where we're at. Now, I agree that um, so that's just talking will get the church to an unsatisfactory place. We will not grow and get to a place that is actually following the scriptures. It doesn't matter to me it does matter to me because I love people. I care about people. I care about my family. I want, I want my children in the future to be treated better in, in, in the Mennonite church than I have if I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I care on a common sense level, a logical level about whether or not we improve regardless of how it's done. But if we arrive at a place 10 years from now with all these young people who are raising kids, um, I have some thoughts here on how we can how we can actually raise our children better to do better. But um, that's, that's not necessarily what I'm talking about right now. Um, if we arrive at a place 10 years from now that is nicer to black people, but does not see them in the biblical, in their, in who they, for who they really are. Um, mm -hmm. Someone who God desires, God loves, God wants us to love and, and um, want, to, want to relate to, then we are not at a good place. And so we, we need to use the um, to use our kingdom knowledge, our ability to know what God wants to come to good places. Um, so it's not that my people will ask, what will make black people happy? What will get them to shut up? Which is a very, unfortunately, very common thought from people mm -hmm. right now. What what do you even really want? You know what mm -hmm. what? And I've gotten those messages. People have kind of spat at me um, and said, you know, what. What do you even want? You're just here to cause outrage and divide the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, I want us to read our Bibles and love people well. And I want us, and one of those things is silence. One of those things is no, is no longer being willing to sit back, go to church on Sunday and, and not be one aware, but two um, against verbally, publicly, honestly, the, um, the wrongs that are in the world. And I get that burden, not from my personal feelings being hurt. I get that from, scriptures right. it's not it's not me saying i want to be heard because i'm frustrated and confused uh -huh. it's saying i'm reading my bible when i'm not seeing it in our culture in our people even in my home church this example this this lived out and 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 then from there you can be forgiving you can say well there are things that you know other people can pick out in the scriptures and say well i don't see this either i don't see this either we preach about those things we preach preach about caring for persecuted Christians. We, we preach about things that are on our hot topic that we really care about. We, we are not talking about oppression of minorities yeah. in America at all. Mm -hmm. Not over the pulpit, not in men's meetings, for a while, not even on social media, unless it was a way to criticize. There is very few redemptive conversations. And I, so that's why I say breaking the silence is a very important step. And yes, it does help. It's for people who have been supporting me, I, it does matter to me. I don't respond to most of them. I don't like comments. I don't affirm them. I don't love them. I don't put the caring emoji on them necessarily. Um, and if I do, it's not extra special necessarily. It, it's, um, but I see it and I care about it. And I, and I see that as progress as help. 
Um, it, when I came to church on Sunday, I sat down, I talked to my bishop. He was, he was preaching the sermon. And I spoke to him. I unleashed on him. I told him that leaders have to do better in Keystone. They have to do better. They have to make change. They have to actually, they have to, I'm not saying you have to rebuke the church, but you need to show how God would, would condemn us. We need to repent. We need to do better. And he heard me out and he, he listened and he said he'd like to follow up with me. He'd like to read my blogs. He'd like to, that, of course, that's progress. Let's not be cynical. Let's not be, let's, mm-hmm. that is progress. And right. it's not the end. It's, it's going to be on my mind for life. I'm not satisfied with, you know, just seeing it get better and then move on and come back three years later when, other, when another thing causes riots. But I am, I am um, interested in a, in a church that is at a place that is not just more effective, but is more loving. That's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. That's what people want to feel. And so when people use loving words, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. But loving words are not as strong, at least in my opinion, as loving actions. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful. It's a place to start. Continue doing that. Do more of that. Not just, not for me necessarily, but for people who you can associate and say, this person might really be struggling right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't go there and, it's, I don't think it is wrong to reach out to someone who of color to identify that there might be a struggle there. I, I've, I've heard people feel insecure about that, feel like um, if I do that, if I, if I go to reach out to a person of color, they'll think that I'm classifying them by their color. Mm-hmm. I know why that feeling is there. There's a lot of people, a lot of people of color, a lot of people of color, a lot of people of color in, church, in Mennonite churches that are there right now a lot of them are um, under the same mindset and the same um, cultural awareness that other Mennonites are. And so if anything, that is a reflection that our skin colors are not as important as we claim to think they are because our, the culture they're growing up in from adoption or from whatever, the youth groups, their sphere of influence, um, have taught them the same things that they, the people around them are saying, that black people are their own problem, black people are whatever. You know, it's, and it's not fair to class everybody there, so I'm not. Um, but I understand how some people have gone to those, those people and have, have been spat back at and told, look, I don't care about my skin color. I just want to be treated like a human being. And so people will leave that comment and say, I spoke to a person of color and they told me I'm doing fine. And I'm like, oh, like we're, we're completely missing the point that, okay, if he's not hurt, if he's not if he's not hurt, then he's not the one we're worried about right now. In fact, I've told people that I've told, I've had conversations with, with a few people of color. Most of them are very hurt. There's been one or two out of 30 or 40 that are, that are definitely not digging it and are like, let's just leave the church alone and stop accusing them of things they're not guilty of. Um, and their voices are valid. I, I hear them. I'm talking to them. I care. Um, they're friends. But I'm not worried about them right now. I, I, I want them to be aware of the wrongs in the world. I, I want them to hear what's being said. I want them to grow. But if they're not hurt, then follow God with all your heart. Pursue God. Um, follow the scriptures. Do well. There are people right now who, who struggle to come to church right now, who are sitting in church, in the back of church, wondering if they should be there. Mm-hmm. That is the pain that, that, is, that should be at the forefront that we should be looking at and saying, how can we talk? How can we help? How can we act to restore, to reconcile? If we need to repent, where do we repent? If they need to repent, where do they need to repent? What do we need to do to fix this hurt and this pain? And it's harmful that the fact that Christians, who in, in large, the world sees as responsible to do these kind of things, are absent, especially conservative Christians at the moment, are absent from the worship services downtown in New York, are absent from the conversations and the actions that call for reform and for, for change to protect people. And it, sh- and it shows a lot of bad things on our behalf. So yeah, I, I say continue speaking, Anthony, continue talking. Just make sure it's not all you do. That's well, right. that's, right. that's exactly the, the point. I, I, it, everything's so backwards. I don't know if people realize if they're if they're historically informed or not how Christian the original civil rights movement was. Um, let me share something real quick. Somebody sent me this the other day. Uh, 
this was a um this is a a pledge card from 63 yes i love this look look at what it took to be a part of this is this is how much christians were at the forefront of this movement in the 60s this is king's if you wanted to march with king i don't know exactly how they were using this but it's a pledge card and and the commitments they were asking of people that were marching in the king rallies were to meditate daily on the teachings of the life of jesus remember always that the nonviolent movement seeks justice and reconciliation not victory that's convicting oh, amen Walk and talk in the, in the manner of love, for God is love. Pray daily to be used by God in order that all men might be free. Sacrifice personal wishes in order that all men might be free. Observe with both friend and foe the ordinary rules of courtesy. Seek to perform regular service for others and for the world. Refrain from the violence of fist, tongue, or heart. That wow. was convicting to me. Strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health. Follow the directions of the movement and the captain of demonstration. This is what it, this is how much Christians were at the forefront of this movement. And it's disheartening to me that we aren't at the forefront of the police brutality movement, that we aren't at the forefront of caring for immigrant children, that we aren't at the forefront of abortion. Hey, yes. conservative Christians talk a lot about, but I don't, uh, it's only my evangelical friends that are actually doing anything. I mean, uh, yes. on an activist scale about abortion, there are huge issues that we're not addressing. And I don't think that we have to do everything, but we got to do something. There ought to be, there ought to be segments of our churches that are involved in these issues and not just mm -hmm. involved, not just like we're trying to get people to admit that there is a problem, but where we exactly. should be is out in front of the problem, trying to lead the solution in Christ. Yes. We should be seeing the problems first. Right. Mm -hmm. Not last. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and I'd like to say maybe just very briefly, <clears throat> another connection from my observations in other domains of abuse on what you said, Keyshawn, about these questions that I keep seeing popping up on social media. And I had to laugh. Somebody asked me this just yesterday or a few days ago. Um, Tell me what they want. I'm like, why are you asking another white Anabaptist on Facebook mm -hmm. what the protesters <laughs> want? Um, like, why would you ask me? Because and, they don't know any and, people of color. They don't have anybody else to ask. But it's, oh, he no, doesn't know they this, have black this friends because they're not racist. <laughs> this yeah, this person does. I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to hold this person up to ridicule, but this person doesn't know me. Like, he could have asked Keyshawn or anyone any other random person he doesn't know on social media um so so and and those and those questions asked in that way where you're like you're not even asking obviously not asking the right person um is is what is what reminds it and and the thread you were describing Keyshawn earlier th this is a this is a pattern that people need to recognize um, that the oppressed can see very, very well. In abuse, there's what we call the checklist mentality, where you'll have an abusive, you, you know, an abusive husband, and it, someone gets involved in the situation trying to, trying to create an intervention, and he's like, well, just, t and he's like, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I feel bad about this. I don't want it to go this way either. Just tell me what I need to do. And yeah. if you give a person like that a list of things to do, and churches often will do this, um, like, okay, you know, try to say three uh, positive things to your wife every day. And, you know, and this list of exercises that, that people who really, you know, people who care and want to fix the situation, they might be helpful. But if you're an abusive person who fundamentally doesn't see the problem and doesn't want to see the problem, that checklist becomes a weapon for you. Yes. Where you I can, did my job. And you're still yeah nasty. oh i can do that oh here you go and nothing in the heart has changed you are st and now you're just using this checklist as a way to dehumanize people and delegitimize their voice because oh i did this i did this i did this and you're still not happy and, um, and what you're and saying, that's what i see happening yeah i see that happening in the race conversation what you're saying ahead, there Keisha. is why there is so much intensity is perceived, and sometimes it is, as angry black men being mean to white people, and mm -hmm. you can never satisfy them. But the truth mm -hmm. is, this is deeper than the checklist mentality, like you said. This right. is deeper than just making us happy. 
that question, I'm not going to say it offends me because that, that arms people would have say, you're just offended. Yes, I'm offended, but I, it, I'm offended too. It frustrates me. It frustrates me when people say, what will make you happy? Mm -hmm. First off, when I write, I'm not trying to speak up in my hurts. I'm trying to speak up for Desmond, Jalen, and I'll stop saying names so I don't, you guys don't Google my friends list and figure out who they are. Um, but anyway, like these people are, are my friends, my family, my brothers. I'm speaking up for them. I'm speaking up for the people of the world. And, and it's a voice that should be more rep represented in our churches, but it's not practically because we're not diverse, but there's more reasons for that. And, um, and so what you're saying there is spot on. There, there is a, and uh, what tends to be a rhetoric that sounds like what you said from the abusers, from, uh -huh. from the people who perpetrate these things. And the problem is it's because, and people aren't gonna like this, some of them are the abusers. Many of them are the abusers. It reveals the fact that they're guilty. Yeah. It's not pretty, but it's true. And not everybody that uses checklist mentality is there, but a lot of people are, are using the same rhetoric. And so what we hear is, yes, I do that, but just tell me what to do for, you know, reparations are spat at. And, you know, what, what are my reparations? And I'm like, dude, you're completely missing my point. Right, I'm looking right. for a kingdom-based response that loves people like me for what, mm -hmm. they're, what they should be loved for. That's what I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. And then we can, and, and through that, yes, we're going to have practical things. I've written about protests. I've written about writing mayors, the, the letters to mayors. That's how we act out of the, the, um, out of the goodness of our heart, out of the compelled, we're being compelled to act. Well, here's how you do that. But more than that are these heart attitudes that have to be changed. That have to be, I agree with all of that, but we will act. We will do something and it won't just be a checklist. It will be behaviors that we are using because we love people. Mm -hmm. We want we mm -hmm. want to do that. Exactly. We want to, we we want to help. We have a heart to help people. Where is that mm -hmm. heart right now? Where is that heart? And, and if we have well, a heart to help, we we're gonna make mistakes. But it's you know it's easy for somebody who recognizes that you have a caring heart and you want to get involved in helping to steer you in the right direction. I mean, I I think people like you, Keyshawn, would be happy to have people genuinely looking for genuinely looking for ways to 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 get on board to make a difference um and, and i think one other thing that i think you've highlighted this pretty well but it's really really important to understand that the checklist mentality comes out of does not come out of a desire to hell um it comes out of a desire to make the problem go away so i don't feel uncomfortable anymore yes. mm -hmm. um yeah. and and it's a way of projecting it's a way of projecting the issue onto the other person saying that oh amen amen did we lose him i'm not sure i think he's frozen on my end did you want to say yeah, he's something broke. Dave? he's broke. yeah I, I think it's hilarious um you talked about the, the asking the question, well, what do they want? Well, we saw what happens with that post, if we're thinking about the same post, where that actual question was asked, and a number of fellows came on there and said, this is what I've experienced, this is what's going on, this is what made, and immediately people told him, yeah, well, that's not actually, because that happened to me once too, and a yes. cop said, and it's like, mm -hmm. so you ask the question, and then when they tell you and you don't like the answer, then you make excuses and say it wasn't actually the case. I mean, I watched that happen in real time. I couldn't believe it. And in our, and in our um, direct messages, we got insulted and we got told that we were um, the people in the church that, were, that Jesus would have rebuked during our time. But we are, we are worldly and we are not focusing the kingdom. And, oh, um, wow. It's, it's definitely happening. And, and I'm and I'm not the only one on that on that status that had that has the has the um, screenshots to share. I didn't I deleted them, but you know it's true. It's there. There and these are again. It's not just bad actors. It's spread all throughout the congregations in America. It's they're there. The people are there. Their teachings. Their children are in the church. Are being raised to think this way. It's going to continue, and it is present. 
And, and I say that because I know I've, I've gone and spoken. I've taken people of color to these churches. I've taken road trips with friends to Kansas. I didn't want to drive, drive alone. I hate driving alone. And, and they leave seeing the same things that I saw. They, they, they sense it. And it's not just fear. It's practically there. It, it is really there. It's visible. It's observable. Um, and um, what you saw there in that thread was a, an example of it. Let me ask. Um, so, so you, so you haven't found as much of a safe haven as you should in, in hearing some of your experiences about people talking about uh, black children being inferior and et cetera, et cetera. Horrible, horrible things. I can't imagine. But I think the the issue of the issue of the day right now is about about what's happening in the world for people of color and and policing. And I think a lot of people don't believe that your experience is different than theirs like with police can what what what's your experience as a young black man been like with what what do you feel like when you have an encounter with police can you describe that and what how it may be different than people in your church's experiences yeah so for those who listen to this um You'll, you'll have to uh, hear me for what I'm saying and what I'm not. Often when I talk about this, people say, yeah, but cops have good hearts. Cops don't, not all cops are that way. I'm just going to say what I think. And you can, you can hear what I'm saying and not what I'm not. Okay. This is really important. I was, I was taught by my dad. It's, it's what we call a talk. And that needs to be different if you, if you don't know what the context, right? But we got to talk. Um, he told me how to act when I get pulled over. He told me how to respond. Um, some of the tips that we've abided by, that I've abided by from my dad's advice, also from seeing other fathers have to give this talk to their children. Um, you've seen it in movies, it's been written about, it's whatever. Um, my hands are always visible, right? Uh, my hands are on the wheel, and if I do something, I announce it. I tell them what I'm going to do. Um, if I open the door, I open it from the outside so they can see where my hand is. If I, if they ask me a question, I, I respond with a polite voice. I never give any impression that I am an aggressive person. And one story I had written about recently, and this is one of several, but to be honest, and my own brother has called me out on this. Well, how many times have you had bad experience with the police? Uh, three times. And then I've had five great experiences. So again, not, I'm not saying certain things that people would assume I would say because I'm a, an angry black man, right? Um, anyway, that hates the police. Um, and, uh, so I got pulled over for a busted taillight on my friend's car. And, um, by the time we were done, just to shorten the story, there were four police cruisers. Um, and a guy had his gun on his hand, walking up to me in a, in a trembling voice. Now you can advocate for the police officer and say, he has good reason to be scared. But my question for you was, what is that reason? What, what did I do? by having a bad tail light that wasn't even my car, right? Which he doesn't need to know that, that's not important. What did I do as a, as a human being made in the image of God that has lived in my community my entire life, minus two years at Faith Builders, I've lived there my entire life, and minus this summer that I'm living in Lancaster. What what did I give him that gave him the right to, to have his gun, and this, and this holster is unbuckled, he's ready to pull it if he needs to. And so he's talking to me from the back of the car. He's like, can you turn your car off? I'm like, yes, sir. I'm going to turn my car off. Turn my car off. Hands back on the wheel. Um, and once he sees that I'm not an angry, scary black man, he treats me like a human being and the three cars disappear. Well, that's an experience that I'm sorry. I believe this confidently that you're probably not going to experience in your lifetime. And it's possible, but it's much more likely to happen in a place of distrust in a tense relationship between people of color and police officers, then it's going to happen to some random person that, that, that doesn't look suspicious, doesn't look fearful. And people have often justified that fear by putting articles, by, by doing whatever, but, that, but that, that concern and that fear that comes is based off of the true, true experience. It's not just the media. It's not just, you know, I have friends that have been beat up by police. My own brother has, has a story in which he watched a police officer, off-duty police officer, beat up his friend. Um, and then when the cops came to police their own people, 
they, they let him off without any charges. They found a way to, to justify. Um, the police, truthfully, uh, we know as people of color, there are police unions, which make them basically untouchable. And that's basically how unions work to begin with. But anyway, um, there are um, corrupt attorney offices that do not have good um, practices to bring, bring down bad cops. And so we have, I believe, and I, and I say clearly, true reason to be concerned. And I try my best as a kingdom Christian not to be fearful. I try to be concerned. I try to say, officer, I'm, I'm here to resolve whatever issue is here. I'm here to support. But ultimately, we should not have to um, be put in a position where we have to respond perfectly to keep our life. That's not right. Right. It's not right. It's, and we can talk ideals all we want. But there is a wrong that comes with people of color being put in positions where they have to be great people. Because the truth is, not everybody in the world are great people. And we, we can't have a government that goes around killing people because they don't do what they want you to do. That's wrong. It's an injustice. It's oppressive. It's wrong. That's why we need to respond. That's why we have to act. That's why we have to. And so that's my experience. It's the experience of my brother, even though my brother is actually a conservative. He's political and he actually likes Trump. He doesn't fit any of the boxes. Nobody in our family does. But he knows the police are corrupt. And he doesn't defend them either. Um, and so the Black experience in America is nearly unified in that regard. And it should not be ignored because we all have experienced it. We all, another example. Um, this is another story. I was in a prayer meeting downstairs in our pastor's basement. What place is safer than your, than your pastor's basement, right? We were having a prayer meeting. We were doing this about every Sunday for a few hours on a Sunday evening. We would, we would go down to pray together. And um, so this one man, which he was a Peruvian who, recently, who he moved a, year, a couple of years ago back to Peru. He was an illegal alien and felt convicted to um, move back home because he was here illegally. Um, eventually, he joined the Catholic Church and um, kind of walked away from Man of Baptist teaching. But he was a racist man. I had had many encounters with this man. Um, he told me one time that I'm lying if I don't think white women are more beautiful. And he said, you bet a thousand dollars I'm going to marry a white woman because they're the most beautiful and other races just don't compare. Uh, this is coming from a Peruvian man. He also told me that my dead father um, was a confused man for marrying a white woman. And he obviously regretted it his entire life. But one, they weren't married, but two, it's not true. Um, uh, or no, my wife, my mom, the other way around, my mom was a confused woman for, for being willing to marry a black man. Um, so anyway, racist man, not a, not a very nice person. And it's shown the church wasn't aware at first. I'd said that he was racist. The church was like, what do you mean? I don't think so. And now everybody realizes it. But again, we saw it first because we understand the struggle. Anyway, the point being, this man brought a, a cult member down. A, it's a, the call is called the creation call, I believe. It's a white supremacist um, call that is actually fairly sizable in America. Church of the Creator. Church of the Creator. I think that's what it is. And um, I know it. They, um, they believe that they have their own commandments. They, they use um, Hitler's rhetoric to um, basically have their own Bible and whatever else. Well, this man comes down into our um, basement, our prayer meeting, and he gets the floor. We all listen to him. And he has a packet full of information that talks about how dirty of a person that I am and how terrible I am as a human being mm. and how genetically um, I should be cast out from the congregation. And my brothers stood up for me to their credit. Um, but the most harming, the most disappointing thing to hear that night, and we, I found out later through investigation that he wasn't lying about it that there were two police officers in our local municipality in the city of York. And one of them was a police officer in our school system. I had encountered this. I know his name. I know who he is. Right. And he's, he's the only one that actually moved. The other one is still here, um, is a part of this cult. A man that literally hates black people literally would, would be willing to see me die. This is the theology of their cult. They would be willing to see me die. They support, they support eugenics. They support abortion clinics because it kills black babies. They, they are all for whatever necessary to eliminate or at least get off this continent people of color so they can live their own haven. 
and they have government they have government power in our in our in our city that that is the state of where we are in america but people are not aware of these things mm. so when i drive down the street what if it's that cop right what if it's him mm-hmm. and 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 that's the, again another just two stories there of um my experience as a black man with with police and there are some others um that we don't have time for, but yes, I have the stories and I have the experience. Um, one, one in what, and, and also just, and I won't, I won't tell the stories behind it. Maybe we could talk some other time about it. We didn't call the police when, when I grew up in the hood because we couldn't trust them. When they came, when, when I called the police on my parents, because either, either there was abuse, either there was, my dad was drunk and hitting my mom. My mom often what it was, and my mom was, was high and, or in withdrawal and hitting him. Either way, there, our house was messed up. There were reasons to fear for my life. I'd call them. They come to the front door. My mom, we always sent my mom because she was white, would come up and explain it away and they'd walk away. And inside is a 10 year old kid fearing for his life that could be getting abused. But the cops were just like, eh, okay, and walk away. We didn't grow up trusting police because they didn't do anything that helped. In fact, police were, you brought in police when you wanted things to get worse, really? when you wanted to hurt someone, when you wanted someone you didn't like to get in trouble, you called the police. That was the only purpose the police solved or to come pick up a dead body or to whatever, but they did not have a relationship with us in the city that made us think that they were here to keep us safe because they did the exact opposite. Well, and I think that's what's hard for people to connect to. That's the empathy piece that's missing. Is And I tried to share that with a few brothers just this weekend is that, you know, people were scoffing at the idea of defunding police departments and how crazy that was that it would just lead to anarchy and everything. And I had to, I, I tried to get, get a conversation going to say, you don't understand what it's like to grow up in a, in a community where you've never had a good experience with the police. The police are only problems in your life. And for your whole neighborhood, the police are only problems. And there's lots of neighborhoods like that. So, the fact that those communities are saying defund the police, we'll, we'll use the money for, for services for other programs and rebuild the rebuild policing and law enforcement in a way that's better for us is a perfectly sensible thing to say. Yeah, but I, I watched my, I watched my friend get brutalized in our school in, in yeah. a place of education. I watched my friend get beat up and granted he punched a kid in the face, but that happened every week in our school. But yeah. because a police officer who had authority walked by, he got cuffed and got taken into print in the jail as a 14 year old with a black eye that's brutality he did not have to punch my friend in the face that was brutality right. but he didn't get in trouble for it because the systems to to correct him are on his side right who is on the side of people of color who is on the side to advocate for those who are being punched in the face and hurt and and it, the church should be in that category like you're saying Matthew. the church should be here to, to be suspicious of those authorities and say, are these people being taken care of? Right. We're, we're not, not lawyers necessarily. We're not all Versos, but we can be, we can be active in, in advocating for those who, yes, they may have done a bad thing, like punch someone in the face, but they did not deserve to be attacked back by an institution that has more power than them. And, and, and I've been many times where a cop has done or said something uh, you look at the the protests or riots or the the violence that happens, and there's a lot of angry cops, mm-hmm. which is the most dangerous position to be in as a person of color, is being in front of a cop who's angry and frustrated at the hate right. they're getting. And I'm right. not, I don't like the hate they're getting either, but they deserve criticism. Don't get me mm-hmm. wrong, and they're not humble. They're not they're not Christians. A lot of them, so they are responding in a carnal way, and they've got cl- billy clubs. They've got mace. They've got bombs. It looks like a war zone in those right. protests. And I'm not watching. I, I hate watching videos on this. I've seen a few, but I've, I'm talking to friends mm-hmm. that have been at these protests in Baltimore, in Philly, in, in um, especially Philly. Philly's been really bad. I've got a brother that lives in Philly. Um, I, they're saying, I got tear gassed and I was kneeling down in subjection and protest. Right. That, that's, that's the narratives that Mennonites do not want to believe because they want to think the best of one group, but they also want to think the worst of another. And right. that is wrong. That is wrong. Yeah. And we have, we have to work against that. It's and wrong every, on both sides. Everybody watching here who, who, who feels that tension should work against that should, should say, no, I'm not going to be complacent. I am not going to be 
um, falling into that trap to believe that every person out there protesting is worse off than these godly, awesome cops that are just wanting to do their job. No, they're barreling through neighborhoods right now, pushing down people, black and white people alike who are protesting. This is, this is also one of the most diverse protests we've ever seen. You've got, you've got, what was it? They weren't Anabaptists, but they were um, Church of God, Church of God, of God and, and witches and uh, uh, what a 50 different countries or something where there are massive protests, um, Australia, uh, other places. Um, you know, the, they're realizing that somebody has to, has to help, has to, I'm not advocating for this necessarily, but there have been white people who have stood in front of the line, in the front line, because they know they won't get to your gas, mm -hmm. which has not been true everywhere. But there are times where the police are noticeably less aggressive in one city. And this is, the, you know, the, the nice gesture of cops kneeling down with protesters um, or apologizing or joining a protest. Well, that's nice. But what you're not seeing is the next day, according to my friend and according, I looked it up and I found the videos. Um, the next day they were, they were hitting them with, with basically what is, amounts to a baseball bat, you know, a billy club, macing them, tasing them and getting them to, to leave. You know, the voice was nice for one day, but we already heard you. If you're not going to listen now, we're going we're gonna to have to show you who's boss. Yeah. That kneeling was fake. And, and thankfully, I don't think it was fake here in York by the ones who were concerned our police chief is a black man. I think that there's some good work that will happen here in Europe. We have a mayor that's interested in change, but in most of America, I'm sorry, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Yeah, and 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 I and I feel like, you know, when for for a lot of people listening to us who are white Anabaptists and you know so-called Kingdom people. Um, <clears throat> There's going to be a lot of questions, I think, in people's minds. Well, why are we, you know, reacting to authority like, you know, the Jews and, 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 and the Jews in Jesus day were under an oppressive government they could do nothing about like we do. Christians do live in situations like that all around the world. The question is whether we as the church are going to identify with the oppressors or with the oppressed. It's 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 not primarily and first the question of whether we're going to of what we're going to do about it or how we're going to confront oppression or whether we're going to agitate for some particular solution which is what critics always want to jump to oh so you support this 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 and this aim of this particular movement no the question is do we identify with the oppressed or do yes. we identify with the oppressors mm -hmm. and and so and and i want and i want to uh again relate uh, just highlight for those of us who have not had your experience, which I haven't, like I've never had a bad experience with a police officer. Um, um, I, I mean, I'm mean a naturally compliant person in a situation like that. And I think many other people who are just assume that if you are like that, nothing will happen to you. I mean, people say that explicitly all the time. Here is here in, in uh, once again, this is rhetoric that is universal across domains of abuse. People who are abusive, and I think your case of the of the of the Church of the Creator cops is a classic example. If I meet a cop who's from the Church of the Creator, I'm one of his guys. Like he doesn't, if he doesn't know me, he's not going to treat me any different than any other cop. Yeah. I'm not going to see any racist cops um, because he he's not racist against me. Um, and this is the issue with with sexual abuse, like or with or with domestic violence, like people are like, well, he was always nice to me. How could this nice person be responsible for all these things? This is how oppression works. Oppressors oppress the people that for whatever reason they have hatred or they can get something out of by oppressing them or whatever. Um, they don't oppress everybody. So the only way we're going to know who the oppressors are is to listen to the stories of people who are being oppressed. Right. Yes. Um, and so we can remain blind to this if we simply insist upon um, insist upon going by our own experience. It is not true that that a bad cop is is you know some are, but most bad cops are not bad to everyone. There are certain situations and types of people that trigger. Thanks. Them. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying yeah. that. Yeah. And That's right on. and and so. And so this, and, 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 and again, 
to to I, you've convicted me tonight because I haven't done a lot of this. Like I'm in the speaking stage and trying to understand the situation, but but my brother uh, went to a protest in Richmond just to observe and witness. You know, I don't think he was like chanting or holding signs even. Um, he was just watching, and he watched the. It was a. It made it made headlines. It was one of those. Six, you know, incidents that was significant in the news. He was there and watched as the protesters, peaceful protesters, no violence, no scuffles, as far as anyone knows, around the General Lee statue in the middle of Richmond. The police just rolled up and without any warning to disperse, half an hour before curfew, they started firing tear gas canisters into a peaceful crowd. Mm -hmm. And, and well, like white Americans, white conservatives especially, they see that on the video and they're like, well, you've got to know the rest of the story. That could, They obviously didn't do that. But the reason we don't know that they, did, that they actually did that is because we aren't going to the places where the hurting people are mm -hmm. and watching what's happening to them. Right. And this is what God did. This is what God did for us. I mean, this is, this is core to following Jesus. He came down and walked with us. And that's the primary way that he confronted the systems of power that were oppressing the world was by coming down from his position of privilege and walking with the people who were hurting. And we have to be finding ways to do that. And, and I think I'd love to have a conversation again um, in the future with you, Keyshawn, about um, on this platform about you know, more specifics on that. But we need to understand that this is a heart of the gospel issue. When we are told to, that Jesus made himself of no reputation and associated with the lowly, <clears throat> he, we're, t we're talking about our core calling. This is not some fringe political issue. If we are not there where the suffering is happening, we have no right to speak into it and claim that, and, and claim that, that, you know, it's not real. Um, one more example of how serious this is not being where 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 things are actually happening the it's the scripture says all jerusalem was troubled when the wise men showed up looking for the king of the jews the religious leaders showed up and read and read the prophecies these wise men clearly had seen signs in the sky that the king of the jews the long-awaited messiah had arrived and and the religious leaders read the prophecies to them and apparently none of them went to check it out none of see it, because it was uncomfortable to them the fact that there could be somewhere out there in rural judea um a, a king that was going to overthrow the system that was working for them and 30 years later these people are saying about jesus no doubt some of the very same leaders are still active in the in, in the jewish culture then and they're saying look Search to look. No prophet has ever come from Nazareth. The Messiah is supposed to come out of Bethlehem. Well, if they'd gone to Bethlehem to look, they would have met the Messiah. They would know where Jesus had come from. But they didn't know because they weren't looking. They didn't know because they hadn't been there when Herod slaughtered the innocents. They hadn't been involved in this whole messy situation because it wasn't comfortable for them. And therefore, when the Messiah arrived, announced himself later on, they are legitimately confused about how this could possibly be a fulfillment of the prophecies. The reason they don't know the prophecies are being fulfilled, the reason they don't know that this is the most significant event in their history as a people that's unfolding in front of them is because they didn't want to know. Yes. They, chose, Thank you. they chose to not be there um, when, when things were going down that, that they knew were significant. Something, and, yeah. So, something that that I'm I've been thinking recently is um, pe you know this we talked about silence we talked about you know feeling bad about talking to people and whatever else. One of the things I had to tell one of my one of my brothers from church is it's not that you have not because you ask not. That's true. The real issue is you have not because you want not. You you don't want mm -hmm. to see the ugliness that I'm seeing. You don't want. Mm -hmm. And and I, thankfully I wish we weren't in a world where you had to. I. I yeah. I wish I wish that this experience wasn't wasn't where it was, but it is. And so we don't want that ugliness. We don't want that mm -hmm. to imagine that, especially 
Um, so, for example, in our church, we are, a, um, as many men in that churches are, a congregation of people who are frustrated or tired or are very happy not to ha- be at the church they came from. Um, they came from a Weaverland church. They came from a, a Keystone, which we are Keystone, but just examples. I'm not highlighting specific places as places I'd be happy to be away mm-hmm. from. It's just examples. And so they're here at our church and they're like, this is the golden example of how churches should be. And I've had people come to me sometimes in the last 13 years. I'm a, I'm a fairly critical person and say, how could you criticize anything? Like, just be happy with what you have, you know? And um, I told them, you don't want to imagine that we could be wrong in this area because we'd have to repent. You don't want to imagine the fact that, you know, it, I think, I don't know if I said it on here or if it was on a different podcast or what, but if, if tomorrow the whole of Mennonite churches, everybody, every Mennonite in the world realized what was going on in the world, realized that they were, that they were wrong for not speaking and not being a part of this, they'd have to wake up tomorrow and half of them would have to move, one, because they're not around people that are oppressed and at least send people, right? Mm-hmm. They'd have to send someone because right now there's a church that meets on Sunday, but they would grow unsatisfied with the fact that we're not living out this example of Christ to more than just ourselves, which we're not even looking out to ourselves for one matter. That's a different podcast, right? Um, We, we would have to, they would have to move and they would have to repent. And those are two things that Mennonites don't like to do. They don't like to say that they're wrong and they don't like to go go to places that are struggling. They don't like to do it. And and to be fair, I understand the struggle. I wouldn't want to move from York. I'm here in Lancaster and it's hard. Lancaster is boring. York. I love York. York is awesome. But I understand the tension, but there's something that has to compel us to say, not everybody, fine. Yes, there's a mission field in the farms. I'm all for that. But we shouldn't, we, you would have to admit that, wow, we need to act. And that's going to involve going into these nasty, ugly, stinky cities that we don't want to go to and learning to love the people who are there and raising our kids in those places. And I'm, I'm telling you, man, I, I'm, I'm so, I struggle so much to see people who would really be willing to do that, who are really willing to put into practice those burdens that they tell me they have, that they, that they write about on their Facebook, that they, they comment on the post. Are they really willing or moving or at least contemplating a move that would involve that? Um, I'm okay with you starting in your home communities, but at least start there, start somewhere. And mm-hmm. it's just troubling as I drive through Kansas, um, several times that I have heading to a church and realizing that for um, the last three hours, I have not seen, um, I've gone past several communities, several churches, and I, and it's just a really good chance that nobody in those churches communicates with an oppressed person at all. And I'm like, th- this is where we are. We have, we'd have to mobilize and change how we do things. And that's a big ask, a very big ask. Well, I don't think people know and, what they're missing gonna... out on. It's such a, you know, we, we have mm-hmm. a, we have a multi-ethnic congregation here. It's beautiful. Uh, Awesome. Yeah, and it's wonderful. It's so it's been, it's been one of the most beautiful things of 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 my church life is to have, not just white people in our congregations. It's it's tremendous. We're um we're approaching two hours, uh, so we should probably wrap it up. I think there's there's a thought experiment that's worth doing for anybody that's still on the fence. You know, if you were to say to me, <clears throat> Matthew, would you trade lives with somebody who lived in? who was born and raised in Canada. Yeah, sure. Uh, how, how about somebody in England? Uh, would you trade lives with somebody who was raised in Switzerland or Germany? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I'm happy with my life, but I, I don't see anything significantly different about, about that. It'd be just fine. Would you trade lives with a black kid that was raised in Philadelphia? Would you trade lives with a black kid who's raised in Detroit? Would you be willing to trade lives with somebody who was raised in Compton? If the answer to that question is no, then intrinsically, you know that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know something's wrong in the community. You know something's wrong in the systems that surround that community. You know at your core that something isn't right. What are we going to do as the church to set those things in order? That's the thought experiment we should be doing. Very much. Thank you so much, Keyshawn. Thanks for having it's, me. It's been a, hard, a a painful <clears throat> conversation, but I but I think it's I think it's been beneficial. 
One thing I'm really, um, and this is kind of along the thought experiment thing, <clears throat> those uh, those cops, and I'm not even sure he was a, I don't know, I'm not even sure he's a black fellow, just a uh, 75-year-old man, the cops that pushed somebody, pushed the fellow over, you know. Yeah. Was, Damn, and I've seen some, I've seen some people saying, you know, because then they got suspended without pay and a bunch of the others resigned because the police union had said, we're not covering their legal bills. And they're like, well, you know, maybe if we do something, they won't cover ours either. And we're not going to be exposed personally by this, um, which is kind of a good point of where the direction some things should go. But my question is, if you have police that are pushing 75 year old men down, and I've had some, I've seen on my Facebook, people talking about this, this unfair suspension of these cops. So my question, if you're watching this and you're kind of, um, you know, pro police in this, I just want to know what a cop would have to do in order for you to think that they need suspended. Because mm -hmm. apparently pushing a 75 year old man down is not doing it. And wasn't he trying to hand him the, hand him the helmet or something or? I, I don't I'm know what not, he was doing. The entire context sure. of the video didn't look aggressive to me at all. It was just pure. They said he tripped, which is exactly the thing they've said about some other people. Yeah. Funny how people trip when video. you shove them in the chest. If it wasn't on video, what anything have happened? Right. That's right. The scary part. We're only right. Seeing, we're only seeing the ones that are on video. Right. You know, this is we're not seeing the the decades, the things my dad had to go through the things that um, my uncles have gone through, the things that are happening right now as we speak at traffic stops that could be ending badly. And mm -hmm. videos are usually very condemning of behavior, but we don't see everything. And sometimes um, at night, the, cro the thought crosses my mind regularly that I don't have my phone charged right now. That vulnerability puts me at a place. And I'm not sure that I would record the police anyway, although I'm not gonna sit here and claim I wouldn't. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I do. And um, you think something wrong with recording or you do I, record? I record them. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, the thought crossed my mind on a regular basis at, at late at night that if I were, if I were in a position where, you know, let's go to extremes. My life was taken. My family would have to wonder what is the, what is the context? What is the, mm -hmm. what happened? And they're not going to get the full story. Cause I guarantee you someone who's willing to murder or hurt someone unjustly i would be unarmed always of course and what would need to save their own their own butt and to tell to tell me that they're going to come forward humbly with the truth when they're a murderer is probably not true and, and again that's some of the again some of the the anxiety that comes with with being in this skin color in america being in this culture not just skin color because again we've talked about examples from the churches of people of color that are not agreeing coming from the culture in the area that i live where every day mm -hmm. there is crime, there are gunshots, there are sirens. What if mm -hmm. I'm on the other end of that? How do I, how do I find a way to, you know, those are just common human desires to, to not want to die um, with people ready to scrutinize and throw your name in the mud. Like the men in that church has been doing with George Floyd, you know, with sharing right. that video oh, from yeah, Candace mercy. Owens that has what, 70 million views. A lot of those views, not most of them, but a lot of them have been from Mennonites who are like, the more you know, you know, I, I don't want to buy into the hype. And I'm like, oh, I won't even get into why that video was false to begin with. But what if I become that? What if I become a symbol of so people have said he's not a martyr? And first off, he, he, the, the evidence and the testimony is, is proving that if we had an accurate reflection of grace and redemption, we wouldn't be calling him a drug dealer. Yes, addiction is sad and him having drugs in it, whatever not up for discussion right now. I'm not willing to discuss those things, but he is an example of what many of us feel and relate to in the fact that if, that if we are wronged, people will find reasons to say that we were not. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why the yeah. distrust exists. Abundantly they will find a way to say, well, Keyshawn, when he was in middle school, smoked marijuana. So right. he, he had a hidden mm -hmm. life the Mennonites weren't aware of. And so uh, everything he mm -hmm. said that is said about him is false. And Candace Owens will do a burn piece on me and try to dig up dirt in my life. And, um, and this is not the church, guys. This is not grace. This is not redemption. This is not seeking redemptive work. It's almost mocking and ridiculing right. the lives of people who are being lost and hurt. So let's be careful. 
Well, some of us are listening, Keyshawn, and by God's grace, we're going to do better. Appreciate it very much. All right, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thanks for everybody who's listening and watching. And uh, yes. mm -hmm. what well, Keyshawn, I want to post your articles on the comment thread for this video for anybody that catches it. Yep. Be great. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thanks. We'll see you. Good night.